Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the what's technically the keynote session at Group Buy. We're sticking the keynote session in the middle of day two in the afternoon. In a second here, I'm going to be talking about dynamic SQL pro tips, but Bly, then the organizers of Group Buy, asked me to speak for a second first about just things that are happening inside the community. So I am Brent Ozar of Brent Ozar Unlimited. My Twitter handle is Brento, and I use the gender pronouns he and him. Um, I really focus on Microsoft SQL Server and making SQL Server go as fast as possible. And I love teaching, travel, and laughing. So first, a moment about the community and where we're at just overall. Data is really at the center of everything. When you go into a business, the data is in the middle of everything. The developers, the end users, the Brett, accountants, sorry, the- oh. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, you've got a bit of a delay between your sound and your video. Any idea Duh. what might be? <laughs> mm, no, no idea there. Uh, it's, it says I can turn on, let's see. I don't have anything that I can configure in Zoom. Is it bad like to the point where we should stop or? Uh, it's only like one bit. second on my end. Ooh. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you've got the whole like, you've had the whole like uh, martial arts Japanese fight movie. movie. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ah, all right. So it's <laughs> sort of old style martial film. All right, so let's do this temporarily. I'll switch over to sharing. Just a second. Stop share. And I will share VMware first for this first one. So we'll share this and share. And cancel. Let's see if this works. Cancel. All right. So do you see the yep. slide deck at least now? Perfect. Okay, cool. So let me blow out of here and then close PowerPoint and reopen it just because I know I've got a little bit of a gotcha there. And I will share my video then separately. Do, 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 do. I got to remember where to do that under here. Start video. And here it goes. Start video. And there we go. Okay, so now let's awesome. come back over to this. Okay, so data is really at the center of everything inside companies. So their end users want to get things from the data. Executives want to get things from the data. Developers are tasked with inserting and updating, deleting things into the database. And I loved this as a, as a systems administrator, as a developer. This is what attracted me to database work right from the get-go because I wanted to be at the center of where everything was at. I wanted to know about changes before anyone else did. If someone was making a change about the business, if someone was adding, acquiring our nearest competitor, if they were rolling out a new development language that they wanted to work with. I loved being right inside the center of everything. And that also meant that I knew about changes before anyone else did. Sometimes the changes were good. Sometimes they weren't so good. Sometimes the changes were very pressing personally. Like if accounting said that, hey, look, we really need to cut costs and SQL Server Expensive Edition is one of the most expensive things that we have. What can you do to reduce the costs of that? Or for example, if I told the executives, look, I really want to go to SQL Server 2020 or whatever, and they'd say, no, I'm sorry, you know, you're going to have to make do with SQL Server sticks and stones version, you know, back from the 1940s. Or sysadmins would just dump in changes on me, and I didn't really have any choice about it. They would say, look, we're going to shove you in the same VM hosts as everyone else. We're going to shove you on the same cloud provider as everyone else. Just, just jamming changes down my throat, and I wasn't often okay with that. On a good year, just on a regular year, change is already overwhelming for us, especially as database people. The amount of changes that we have to deal with can just hit you one thing after another to the point where it feels like every time that you've conquered one change, you have a whole nother hill that you have to go and climb. The buzzword frenzy is just frenetic and every vendor is trying to shove things at you too. You got to learn this right now or else you're a dinosaur. You got to learn this right now or else you're a dinosaur. Never, you don't want to be a dinosaur. You better go learn Power Azure for the cloud. You know, you had like 5,000 things that you're told if you don't do this right away, then you, the changes are going to outpace you. And the changes this year are terrifying. There are so many big giant conglomerate corporations that are really taking over, acquiring all kinds of other little tiny ones. 
there are startups that are exploding. And by exploding, sometimes I mean that's a good thing. And sometimes I mean it's a terrible thing. If you're the kind of person who has to face change and you're working at a startup or else a startup comes and eats your lunch or else a startup evaporates while you're in it, these things can be really terrifying. You may hear things like the sharing economy or the gig economy that are really transforming the way that we do business. And as a database person, I have to deal with all of this. I'm constantly hearing we need to store more data. We need to be more agile. We need to be able to analyze more data quickly. We have data scientists who want to analyze it. You have to give everyone sysadmin rights. And I was already stressed out on a good year. On a good year, it was hard for me to deal with all these things. But in a year like this year, oh my God, it's terrifying. Especially right now, you're probably watching this from home. I've been working remotely for like the last 15 years. So I should be used to this by now. But even I get stressed out this year. This year is different. Working at home is different. Everything about what we do is different as a data person. And between all of the demands that are coming to us from all different people inside of the organization, from all the people outside of our organization that are jamming change down our throat, and just things that are happening out in the world right now, as a data person, because we're in the center of all of this, it can feel like we're being attacked from all sides. And so it's very tempting to feel alone. It's very natural to feel alone whenever we're running into this. We feel like we're the only ones and we're doing battle against all these kinds of crazy other forces. But the thing is, you're not alone. The community is really made up of all kinds of other individuals. And for you to get a sense of how big the community is, I want you to go over in Slack right now. To those of you who are watching and you're in in the Slack, I just want you to type... I'm here and I want you to tell me where you're at in the world. Tell me like which part of the world you're in and I'll start it out. I'll go pop over into Slack here and I'll say I'm here in San Diego, California. And let's see what kinds of results come out here and just watch as these things roll in. The first time that I walked into a big global conference, the first time that I walked into an international conference, I walked in, looked around, and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. There are so many people here, big giant conference facility. I had no idea that there were so many people out there who do the same things that I do working with data. And meeting them in person, it was like, oh my God, I can just like, I want to put my hands around all of them. It was just amazing and empowering and exciting. You hear all this, Jay Falk, a good friend of mine who I met in person at conferences here in Austin, Texas, waiting for the Thunderbirds to fly over. Lancashire, United Kingdom, New York City, Maryland, Des Moines, Iowa, Pinal in uh, uh, Ahmedabad. I want to say it's Ahmedabad or from Ahmedabad. Um, Como, Italy. Wow. What are you doing in here? Why don't you be out like Lake Como? I hear amazing things about that. Oh, Ahmedabad is his hometown. This is just amazing. And over in the, in the, uh, go, in the Zoom chat, there are more people saying things like Cheetan for, Cheetan from uh, South Africa, Kanchan from Nashville, Tennessee. This is really what the community is. There are so many people out here, and I bet a lot of these names you don't recognize. A lot of these names you haven't seen before, and you might even, those of you who are typing in, are feeling a little bit more empowered now, that you are joining in with this and you feel like you're participating more. That's because the community isn't made up of just the people on this side of the camera. The people is made up of, the community is made up of something much larger than this. I'm gonna go back over to the slide deck here for a second. Deborah, good to see you as well. Mr. Ashot from uh, D uh, DFW. Let's go pop back into the slide deck. There's a rule out there called the 1% rule. It doesn't have anything to do with finances, although that's another 1% rule. The 1% rule is that in online communities, the content that you see is only produced by 1% of the community. On average, there are just 1% of the people in any community. Now, there are no statistics to back this up. Obviously, somebody made this rule up and it's just holding out. But the 1% rule says that 99% of the community is actually made up of people who lurk. 
people who hang out and don't feel like they don't contribute much, that they're just maybe leaving a comment every now and then, but mostly they're just the silent majority, like most of us, a very big majority. This presentation isn't about getting you to stop lurking. Lurking is awesome. Because after all, we all lurk and present in different communities to different levels. I don't get involved as a contributor in most of the communities that I'm in. I'm a contributor in the SQL Server community. But if you take any other community, like say, cars, I love cars, I adore cars, I keep models of cars on my desk, I surf car websites every day, it's the first thing that I open long before I open any kind of SQL Server news sites, I'm much more interested in cars, I devour TV shows about cars, I read podcasts about cars, I'm never going to contribute any car content, it's just never going to happen. Nobody wants to watch a video of me talking about cars because I don't know that much compared to the people who actually get up on stage and do things, the Doug DeMuros, the Tavarishes. I lurk in those car communities and there's nothing that you could ever say or do that would get me to go into the 1% who actually contribute. And yet the car communities out there like Jalopnik or Bring a Trailer are a huge vital part of my life. Like if I had to define my personality, I think I would define myself much more about cars than I do about SQL Server. For example, Bach just joins over the Slack and he says Munich, Germany, and I immediately want to go and talk about German cars, for example. There's nothing wrong with being in the 99% of the silent majority. The thing that I want you to take away with is you are among a much larger group of people than you had realized before. You're amongst the community and I don't want you thinking that you need to compare yourself to speakers or presenters or volunteers or anything like that. If you want to join that group, you can. There are amazing career opportunities. Every one of us who's up on stage is all about bringing as many people as we possibly can up. You see during group buy, part of this, this uh, sessions or this uh, conference's original motivation was to get people up and get them started easily with speaking without some of the pressure that comes into becoming an international conference speaker. So, if you want to get into that 1%, you can, but if you don't, if you want to stay in the lurkers, that's fine. We, the people who are speaking, are here for you. We're here because of you, and we're here to help you with the times of change like this. Times of change like this are incredibly terrifying. There's so much going on. It can feel like you're going to lose your job tomorrow, or your skills are be becoming a dinosaur, but that really is what this community is all about. We feel enough pressure from change, enough internal facing pressure from our day-to-day -day jobs, from the changes that are happening. And the way that a lot of us like to give back is we like to push that back out and share everything that we know. We like to share every piece of T-SQL, Power BI, anything that's out there, we get pumped by sharing these same kinds of things at the same time. We love sharing these things to y'all who are in the 99% and we're here for you when you run into problems. If you feel like you're in any kind of bad place, if you feel like you're in a bad place career-wise, if you feel like you are intimidated by something about technology, the community here in Slack is utterly fantastic for people to talk to. And if you feel like you're in a bad place personally, if you're stuck in a house, you're having a bad time and you need somebody to talk with, by all means, come into Slack and you'll find a huge supportive community of people who are all about helping you solve the problems that you're running into. So with that, now I'd like to help you with Dynamic SQL, which is a lot less attractive than it sounds, but I might as well teach you something technical while we're here. So let's go hop out. So now I'm going to switch around and I'm going to change the sharing. And I know that y'all liked that, uh, the speed of that sharing, but I'm going to change the sharing because I'm going to, and my audio and video may be a little bit out of sync, um, but I'm also, oh, I'm going to record, hold on a second here. I'm going to record this locally too, just so that I get a nice clean copy. Just a second. Here we go. Let's go hit record. 
and then minimize this thing down. Let's switch over to sharing my T-SQL and let's share, do, 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 do. Actually, you know what? I can leave it just the way it is. Ah, screw it. We'll just leave it just the way it is. So y'all are seeing, let's see, y'all are, oh, y'all aren't seeing anything now. Let me go fix that. Hold on a second. Where the hell did Zoom go? He sounded so good and then everything went to hell in a handbasket. Oh, it is sharing. No, uh, exit full screen view, share, share my VMware and off he goes. Cancel, the host has spotlighted your video. All right, close, get rid of PowerPoint. Tracy says Brent was humming again. It's pretty much any time that I get involved with uh, doing demos, I pretty much immediately go into that mode. Okay. So in this session, I'm gonna be talking about dynamic SQL. And when I talk about dynamic SQL, what I mean by that is that so often in our lives, we have to write a multi-parameter search stored procedure. Someone wants us to write a stored procedure and they want it to cover all kinds of crazy bases. They want it to, um, Andy says, resolution is hosed and text yeah. is unreadable. So I was just gonna uh, bring that up. You were having some blurriness issues before for the, the presentation you were doing, it wasn't it? A big issue, oh. but. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, okay. So is it okay now? Um, somewhere in between. Like we can read the code pretty easily, but the like the results are a little blurry. The results. Are, okay. Hold on a second here. Let's see if there's anything I can do to change that in Zoom. Do 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 more. Oh, I can. Oh, there's a box I can check for optimize screen share with video clip. All right. Let's try that. All right. So is that getting any better? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the text is a lot better now. Oh, okay. All right. All of a sudden, uh, Andy says much. Do you intend to show Slack also? Yes. I intend to show Slack too, just so that people can see the questions as they come in because they will start coming in rapid fire as the stuff, as we start to start talk through it. Okay. So now let's talk about dynamic SQL. The users, oh, Exilla says uh, YouTube streaming looks way better than Zoom. Okay, cool. So with dynamic SQL, what my users have said is they have this table at the Stack Overflow database. The Stack Overflow database, totally open source. It's licensed under Creative Commons. You can do all kinds of SQL sneakers. Says, can you zoom in Zoom? Am I not showing? Uh... So folks, it's, don't be funny. Uh, don't be funny in terms of joke questions because uh, it just get, makes it a little tricky there when I'm trying to uh, troubleshoot real time. Okay. So um, the Stack Overflow database has customer questions or has all kinds of questions and answers from people. Every time people ask a question, post a comment, et cetera, all of that is over there at stackoverflow.com. Stack Overflow open sources their database so that anyone can go off and read, uh, run demo queries against it. I like it so much better than I do the uh, like AdventureWorks databases. Everything that I'm going to show you today, including the database itself, is all available up there at brentozar.com slash go slash dynamic, including the script that I'm running. So the script that I'm running is already up there as well, if you want, for those of you who want to follow along, but you totally don't have to. The users table at Stack Overflow holds exactly what you think it holds. A list of everyone who's ever logged into the Stack Overflow database, posted a question, posted an answer, et cetera. I have the schema of it up here on the screen or I have the top 100 rows out of here on the screen. And my users have said they wanna run a search stored procedure. They wanna be able to find users who have a particular display name, a particular location, a particular reputation, and they wanna be able to find them very quickly. They don't wanna wait around for a full table scan. They want queries to be extremely quick. Ideally, they wanna be able to use indexes. So let's start with a baseline of how slow is it to scan the entire table as I go through and I do query tuning. So let's start with doing a select count star from that table, which will force SQL Server to do a table scan. This should be my worst case scenario here in terms of performance. Scanning the whole entire table would be what we call bad. So how many pages do I read when we do a full table scan? 141,000. So this is my worst case scenario. And I'm gonna put it over there in Slack so that we can all see it. Worst case scenario, table scan, paste. There we go. 
Now, in order to give SQL Server a fighting chance, I'm gonna go create a few indexes. I'm gonna create indexes on the display name, location, and reputation column, which hold exactly what you think it holds, where people live, what they like to call themselves, and the reputation points that they've earned at Stack Overflow. And the query that my users want me to write, they want it to look like this. They want a stored procedure that will take either just a display name or just a location or just a reputation or any combination thereof. For example, they wanna be able to find all the Brents who live in San Diego or all the people in Indiana with a reputation of 100,000. So remember this for a second, because I'm gonna need you to be my unit tester. I'm about to show you my code. I already wrote a stored procedure that does this, and I'm gonna show it to you. I need you to tell me what the bug is. So let's go look at the stored procedure. Here's the code. You tell me what the bug is inside this code. Here's my stored procedure. Tell me why this isn't going to work. I'll give you a second to go type it in there in Slack. See what you come up with. Emmanuel says the good old kitchen sink. That's close. Yeah, Dimitri nails it. Dimitri says there's a single if condition and it'll only return one thing. If they search for display name, we'll return that. If they search for location, we'll return that. But if they search for both, if they look for both display name and location, then we're gonna have a bad time. Okay, look, so the results aren't going to be accurate. Who cares? This is version one. Let's just ship it and see what happens. So let's go put it into production. Let's go move this out. And then, and Jim says the order by doesn't work. Yeah, I haven't implemented that yet. See, it says up at the top, order by isn't implemented yet. I swear I'll do that later, love the last guy. Um, so we put it into production. Let's at least just see if it works. So here I've said, go show me all of the Brents in San Diego. And if I look at the execution plan, SQL Server was willing to use an index, but unfortunately it used the index on display name. It looked up all of the people who were named Brent, but it didn't do any filtering on location. If I go back over and look at the messages, sure enough, it does show all the Brents, but it doesn't show all the people who live just in San Diego. It's fast though. Notice that because it does do that index seek, it does way less logical reads. Well, it's kind of awesome. It's only about 5,000 logical reads. If only it produced the right results, we'd be out of here. Unfortunately, it does not. And if I try it with a different set of parameters, for example, if I say, go show me all the people with a reputation of just two points, then SQL Server, again, will use an index. It used the index on reputation. Oh! If only the results were right, we would be fine because this is also way less logical reads than an entire table scan. Off to a good start. But of course it doesn't produce the right results in my users, I don't know about your users, but my users are kind of sticklers in terms of accuracy and that isn't gonna cut it. So I need something else instead. Andrew asks, will it always default to an index if there's one present? No, it's gonna depend on the parameters that come in, but more on that here in a minute. So let's do a different version of this. Let's say this is the true kitchen sink design pattern. What this says is, if they passed in display name, use it. Otherwise, just take the display name of the row that we're on. If they passed in location, use it. Otherwise, just take the location that we're on. It's called the kitchen sink design pattern because it's just one query where we've thrown in everything in the kitchen sink into our where clause. Let's see how it performs because at least it should give us the right results. Let's go see. I'm going to put it into production. So let's go through and do the creator alter. Then I'll go through and run it. I'm going to run it just for Brent. And good news, good news, everyone. It actually does just return the Brents. And is it willing to use an index? If you've had a few beers and you just kind of glance, after all, it's afternoon somewhere. If you just glance, not that that stops me, that's a Bloody's and Mary, Bloody Marys and Mimosas are for, right? That's probably the end of that one. 
So if you just take a quick glance, Taryn, Taryn points out tequila. Uh, it's also tequila in the morning. That works out as well. If you just take a quick glance and you were only doing a little bit of testing, you'd be like, ah, this is actually okay. Let's go ahead and ship it. And you might not actually notice that that's an index scan. Who cares? Let's just rock and roll and go see what happens. If I go look at the messages, it read less pages than there are in the table. They're like 140,000 reads across the entire table. We read less than that. So it performs, right? Let's try a different parameter and go see what happens. Let's go try it for say, Indiana. Well, that's not quick. In fact, that's, that's what we call slow. That's what we call real slow. It's what we call terrible. So what's happening here is that SQL Server sniffed the first value that we used. SQL Server sniffed the value for display name and it said, ah, oh, I bet most of the time when you run this query, you're gonna be searching by display name. But you know what I should do is I should build an execution plan that's going to be safe regardless of what parameters you pass in. For example, if you don't pass in display name, maybe if you say pass in location, I need an execution plan that's still gonna work. And the plan that it chose is now very hilarious. It used the display name index. It didn't use the location index. It used the display name index. If I hover my mouse over that to see what's going on, if I hover my mouse over here, it says, go check the predicate down there at the very bottom. The predicate says, go return all the rows where the display name matches what they passed in or what they passed in was null. All the rows match, all of them. All nine million rows match because I didn't pass in display name this time. So then this is where I really wish that execution plans were three dimensional. When you glance at those numbers, they don't look too bad. There's just, you know, tens of thousands of rows. Stack Overflow in this copy has 9 million users. So this operation couldn't have been that big of a deal, right? Hover your mouse over this and look at number of executions. When Microsoft renders a, a pop-up like this, they tend to do it in one of two ways. Either they put everything in alphabetical order, which makes no sense for storytelling, like when you're trying to find the thing that you're looking for, or they load up the data cannon and they just fire this shoulder mounted data missile at the screen and wherever data happens to spray randomly, that's where it goes. This is a shoulder mounted data weapon kind of a tool tip where things are scattered around in no apparent order. But when you find number of executions, it was done 9 million times because all of the rows that came out of that index on display name, all of them match. So when SQL Server has to do 9 million key lookups, this is where I, I really wish it was three dimensional based on the number of executions. Every one of those represents multiple logical reads. Remember our worst case scenario before for reads? Our worst case scenario was 140,000 pages. Now, if I go over to the messages tab, I got to put the commas in here because this is a little too hard for Microsoft, a database vendor to figure out how to group decimals together. I, I understand it, it's, it's a pretty challenging task. That's 27 million logical reads on an object that's only got 140,000 pages in it. That's why this thing takes a damn long is he's doing 9 million key lookups. And of course now too, even though the data comes out, we didn't ask for it like sorted by or anything like that. We have a tiny sort inside here where SQL Server just didn't estimate the right amount of RAM necessarily either for thousands of rows. That'll really come back to haunt us when we do things like say, instead of Indiana, we do India. Now SQL Server's really gonna make an absolutely terrible decision. And based on how long that last query took, I don't even need to bother running this to explain how terrible that is. So this is why users are like, Ugh, that kitchen sink design pattern, that doesn't work with a damn. And people who run this or people who do this in production, usually they only do it once. They do it a whole bunch of times early on in their career before they understand how bad it is. And then later on in their career, they start to understand that this stuff doesn't scale. They only do it in production at a big company once and then they walk away from it. 
And they're like, uh, what, was there some other tool that I can use instead of this? Is there something other than, uh, uh, something other than uh, where, you know, kitchen claw, kitchen sink, wear claws? And there is, there are lots of other options. So one of my favorites in here is is null, because it's kind of fun to explain. If the display name is null, then we're going to pass in display name. Otherwise, just use search display name. <laughs> Well, that ends up producing really crappy execution plans as well. Let's go put this into production and let's go run it. So now I ran it for Brent and I look at the execution plan and remember my worst case scenario? Well, we're right back there. We're scanning the entire table. If I hover my mouse over here, it kind of makes sense as to why the thing right by my arrow has that predicate there where it talks about, oh my God, I got all these different functions to run. Who knows what is going to end up returning inside of here? So SQL Server ends up scanning the whole entire clustered index rather than doing a seek into each of the indexes. Hugo says that's just heard the best way ever to describe order of properties and execution plans. Thanks, Brent. You're welcome. You're totally welcome to use that. Jacob asks, is there any difference between coalesce and is null over in Slack? Jacob, I'm so glad you asked because that's literally the very next demo that I have. You and I think exactly the same way. You shouldn't be excited by that. I don't think very well. So coalesce is my very favorite command in all of SQL Server. Coalesce takes the first non-null value. I like it better than is null for two reasons. One, I can pass lots of parameters into it instead of just one. It's really good for things like price overrides, for example. Two, I love it because it's so beautiful to say, coalesce, it's just peaceful. My wife and I have had discussions about what would ever happen if we bought a yacht. I would love to name the yacht coalesce because it's so incredibly smooth, coalesce doesn't perform worth a damn, but it's just really peaceful to say when you're worried about your code. So I'll go put this into production and I'll go see how that one performs. So let's go run it. And I'm gonna run it for just Brent first. Go look at its execution plan and sadtrombone.com. This doesn't perform worth a damn either. The reasons behind all the problems that I'm describing to you here affect all kinds of multi-parameter stored procedures. They affect all kinds of one purpose for one search fits all stored procedures. Things where sometimes we do a monthly process and sometimes we do a daily process. It's very common to run into these kinds of issues. Jacob also likes coalesce because it handles different types of data, data types differently than is null. That's true too, it just doesn't perform worth a damn. So I need something else. I need a different way that's gonna perform. And that's where people start off with dynamic SQL. The problem that I'm facing here in these query plans, this parameter sniffing problem is not solved by dynamic SQL. It's just that our blast radius is going to suddenly become much smaller. And I'll show you what that means. Bill says, with an option recompile, does that produce different results? It does, but the problem is, as soon as my developers learn about the magic of option recompile, and I can use it with any of these, if I say option recompile, what this tells SQL Server to do is build a brand new execution plan for this set of parameters, and you don't have to worry about caching it for anyone else. So in that case, SQL services, sure, I'll, I'll build a brand new execution plan every time this thing runs. You want to go for Brent? I'll build a perfect execution plan designed just for people named Brent. I'll give you perfect estimates. Then if you want to turn around, SQL server sounds like a guy in my world because he's dumb and stubborn and he refuses to ask for directions. He's all, trust me, I got this when he doesn't actually got this. So if I turn around and I run it for say Indiana, boom, I get an index seek on the uh, location index and my estimates are mwah, beautiful for Indiana. But the problem is as soon as I show developers to this, as soon as I show developers and say, hey, there's this, this thing that you can use called option recompile. Well, what happens is they start putting it everywhere and they don't notice this up at the top compile CPU and compile time. Every time this query runs, it's gonna burn CPU time. And of course, in my example, it's a very simple query. It only takes two milliseconds to compile a plan. 
but my query doesn't look like your queries. Your queries, if they're, when you look at the execution plans, it looked like Jackson Pollock was all up in there spraying paintbrushes every which way but loose, sketching out all kinds of joins together all over the place. So then Steve says your plan cache gets full. No, it's the exact opposite of the problem. You don't have a plan cache. There's no plan cache ever. There's no plan cache because SQL Server has amnesia. He's getting drunk on tequila every single time somebody runs queries and he keeps burning all this CPU in order to do it. So I'm okay with option recompile when queries run like once a minute or less frequently. But if they run more often than once a minute, I want something better than option recompile. And that is where dynamic SQL comes in. Now dynamic SQL has a lot of gotchas, a lot of drawbacks. And the way that this demo script works is it's all written out with comments with me talking to you so that if you do want to go on and learn even more than I'm going to cover inside here, you can go run it all throughout uh, and run it step by step, listening to every piece of advice that I have inside there, talking you through dynamic SQL. I'm only going to make it so far in during this session, but I give this whole script out to you so that you can continue the learning on your own. So here's dynamic SQL. What dynamic SQL is, and I'll do a quick poll here. We'll do a poll over in Slack. I have written dynamic SQL before, and yes, no, whoops, no, anonymous limit one. And the way that polls work inside Slack is you click on the right-hand side with the option, like I'll click on number one, and that answers the poll number one right there. And we'll get a quick feel for how many people have uh, written dynamic SQL before. Vlad says over there, Vlad says in, uh, in uh, uh, Zoom chat, he says, it's hard to get devs to let go of option recompile and or no lock once they've gotten the taste of them. They start th thinking that either of the two fixes more options than it causes. That is why I teach training classes. So out of those, for those of you who are doing the poll, about 38 of you have done dynamic SQL before, seven of you say no. Okay, cool. So a quick explanation of dynamic SQL is that I'm going to build a string and what you'll usually see is you'll see people putting where one equals one. There's nothing magic about this. The whole thing with one equals one is just simply so that when we go to add more things to the where clause, we don't have to detect whether something was written to the where clause yet or not. In here, I'm saying, and I'm going to maximize this so that you can see more of my T-SQL, in here, I'm saying if they passed in display name, then go add and display name is like whatever they passed in. And I'm using parameters. You don't have to append it directly to the string. You'll see why later. And then and location is like this, reputation is like this. So this way, SQL Server is building a string that exactly matches whatever the user passed in. It's kind of like option recompile in a way, but not. And you'll see what I mean by that. Then at the very end, the magic comes together when I say SP execute SQL. And I pass in the string that I want to execute, a list of the parameters that I can pass in, and then the parameters individually. You don't have to do any uh, dynamic change requests to figure out or logic to figure out which parameters people passed in. Just pass in all of the stored procedure or dynamic SQL parameters every time, whether you need it or not. And then SQL Server, it's okay if you pass in extra ones like I'm doing here. If the user only searches by display name, I'm going to have a couple extra parameters. Who cares? It doesn't matter. So let's see this put it in. Andrew says over in the Zoom chat, he says, this doesn't per, uh, uh, prevent parameter sniffing. No, exactly, Andrew. That's what I said earlier. You just weren't paying attention. That's okay. They make pills for that. So I'll go put this stored procedure into production, and then I will go blow my plan cache, and I'm going to run it just for Brent. Now, if I run it just for Brent, I get an execution plan that uses the display name index. Oh! And if I go over to the messages tab, it only did 5,000 logical reads. Oh! And if I turn around and search by, say, Indiana, oh! I get an execution plan that uses the location index. Oh! I can't go a whole lot higher than that, sorry. 
And then maybe I should have tried the lower angle. I, I can go lower than that. Then if I look at the messages, we're still way better off than a table scan. Oh. But like Andrew said, when he wasn't paying attention to what I said earlier, this doesn't fix parameter sniffing. Because if you look at the execution plan that I just built for India, SQL Server sniff, Indiana, SQL Server sniffed this for Indiana and built an execution plan designed for Indiana. If, on the other hand, I turn around and I change my incoming parameter, now, before I run this, I want you to note that right now it's estimating about 23 or 29 or 2395 rows. So I'll put that out over in Slack just so that we remember. So Indiana, Indiana, estimate 2395 rows. Or yeah, rows. Now let's turn around and run it for IN percent and run it. And if I look over at the execution plan, the estimate is still the same. The estimate's still just 2,395 rows. In actuality, a lot more came back in. This is what I meant by it doesn't fix parameter sniffing. It just reduces the blast radius. Right now, just the location plan is crappy. Not all of the plans, just the location one is crappy, and it's crappy for a specific set of users. If they're trying to go after very large and popular locations, they may end up doing more reads than there are pages in the table. We're right back to our old faux parameter sniffing. So how bad of a problem is that? In order to figure it out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to free the plan cache, and then I'm going to go run all kinds of stuff. Jacob says, do we care about string plus pl string versus concat string string? I don't care about those things. I, though I'll be honest, there are a lot of things that I don't care about. Christoph asked for a completely unrelated hint. I don't cover that here. For in fixing parameter sniffing, I'll give you another class that I go talk about parameter sniffing on. The, the point of this here was just to teach you that it doesn't fix parameter sniffing. It actually multiplies parameter sniffing. We have more places where parameter sniffing will happen. It's just that each of them's blast radius will be way smaller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to free the plan cache, and then I'm going to run it for all kinds of different parameters. I'm going to run it for location, display name, reputation, and combinations of all three of those. Then after they finish, I'm going to go run SP Blitz Cache. What SP Blitz Cache does is it gives the top 10 most resource intensive queries on your server. And for bonus, it also throws errors when you don't have the right parameters or when you don't have the right version. I have a test version inside there. Thankfully, it doesn't matter. It still works well enough for what I'm doing. Here, what it gives you is the top 10 most resource intensive query plans. There's all kinds of things you can use for sorts or whatever. In here, you'll notice that the top line is the stored procedure itself. The stored procedure itself is in there as the top line, and it's been executed several times. See how it says six executions over there. Then we have several different queries, each of which were just executed once, each of which are now vulnerable to parameter sniffing. However, each of them get their own plans, which means that I can use one index for display name, I can use another index for location, I can use another index for combinations of the two. For example, if I look at combinations of them, see this one right here is looking for people who have one specific display name and one specific location. Let's see what indexes SQL Server chose to use in order to accomplish that query. Let's go grab you over here and look at his query plan. And look at this sorcery that SQL Server did. I'm going to go magnify this so I can make it even bigger for y'all. So here, SQL Server said, first, I'm going to go find all the people who are named a specific thing. Then I'm going to go use the location index as well, because you're using both of those. You're passing in display name and you're passing in location. That's freaking magical. That wasn't anything that I could get those stored procedures to do before. This is way better than what we had before. That's fantastic. Now, when I'm looking at the output of SP Blitz Cache, if I'm looking to see which queries I want to go tune, 
This is where dynamic SQL starts to suck. And this is really what the rest of this session and the rest of the script is all about, telling you basically all kinds of terrible things that have happened to me when I've been trying to troubleshoot dynamic SQL and giving you cheat codes in order to make your life easier. For example, if I'm looking at this stuff right here on the screen and I'm looking at to go see which queries I need to tune well, sucks really bad when I click on one of these that's dynamic SQL. It sucks really bad because I can't tell who wrote it. I can't tell that it's dynamic SQL. I mean, I can tell it's dynamic SQL, but I don't know who built it. I don't know what the stored proc was. I don't know what the DLL was, whatever application code built it. Maybe it's being done in C sharp. Maybe it's being done in Java, whatever. Well, you control the string. And if you're building dynamic SQL, literally the very first thing that you should do when you go and build dynamic SQL is that as you're building the string, you should start your string with a comment. And the first thing inside the comment should be, this is the name of the code that's building that dynamic SQL. For example, here, it's the search user stored procedure. So that's exactly what I start my dynamic SQL string off with. Let's see how that pays off. Let's go put in that stored procedure into production. And then let's go execute it. So now I've called it for a display name of Brent. And then I'm gonna go run my monitoring tool to see what have been my most resource intensive queries. And if I look, I have a line for the stored procedure and I have a line for the select statement. What's the query plan? Or for those of you who are into query store, for example, when you go and look at the query plan, it says right up at the top, USP search users. So now I know what built that dynamic SQL. So that then when I right click on it and I go say, show me the, ex uh, the uh, query text. Well, that sucks. Who writes their queries all on one line? It's probably you. You're probably the one that I keep having to come after and somebody has one big long line as if carriage returns and line feeds cost extra. Well, again, you control the T-SQL. So as you're building it, the next pro tip that you use is you start every dynamic SQL tool by building a carriage return and line feed character. So here's what I'm doing. I'm starting by declaring a CRLF, carriage return line feed. And it's a variable that I can then go pepper into my code wherever I want as I'm building my dynamic SQL so that I can put in line returns without having to take up all kinds of space inside my stored procedure. And I start the dynamic SQL with the carriage return and line feed and then goes immediately the code. Jacob says, why not just line feed? Jacob, Jacob. Jacob, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. Jacob, someday you'll work on a cross-platform environment. And you'll have to deal with people who use both Windows and Linux and all those things. So let's go put this stored procedure into production. And you'll notice that I just peppered in all over the place, lots of carriage returns and line feeds. Now, when I go in and free my plan cache, run USP search users, and then look at the plan cache again. Now, when I go in to look at my query plan, it still looks like boiled hell up at the top, but when you right click up there and you click edit query text, then you get oh, this magical, nicely formatted query. Very cool. In a perfect world, I would love to fix the parameter problem. In a perfect world, I wish that Microsoft didn't put these inside of parentheses. I don't know why they do this. This is the dumbest thing. What they should just do is say declare instead, because that's what all of us end up doing, and then taking out the final parentheses. I can't do that for you because Microsoft jams that in in terms of the execution plan, but at least this makes your life suck a little bit less. All right, that gets us closer to the point where we actually have this dynamic SQL built up in a way that we can read it. But who wants to free the plan cache every single time you're trying to test dynamic SQL, every time you're trying to figure out what SQL was built and what SQL was executed? We need a better way than that. So every time that you go and build dynamic SQL, you wanna add in two commands. You want to add in a debug print uh, query parameter and a debug execute parameter. 
So this way that if you want to just print out the contents of your T-SQL to the messages tab, you can play around with these input parameters. Super useful for testing, especially when I'm building dynamic SQL that does things like restore databases thing or delete rows that I want to make really sure I get it right before I go on and do something harder. So let's see now how that works. I've got this debug print query and debug execute query. If I go down a little further, I say, if the user asked us to print the query, go print it. If the user asked us to execute the query, go execute it. So now I can do my debugging right here at the command line, so to speak. I like to think of SSMS as the command line. It's pretty nice. So I'm gonna go in and run my query and now if I pass in debug print query, I get oh, a nice little T-SQL right here over in the messages tab. And when I'm doing things that could break data, then I could just turn off this debug execute query. So now the thing just builds my dynamic SQL without actually executing it. Ooh. I do have to say that this trick only works if you have things that are 4,000 lines long instead of uh, longer than 4,000 or 4,000 characters long instead of more than 4,000 characters. If you have more than 4,000 characters, there's this function called helper long print that you can use to go print uh, really long strings. I would just say that, that if you decide to do that, you're at the point in your life where you should really reconsider your decisions. You're at the point of your life where you should probably not be putting 4,000 lines of stuff inside Dynamic SQL, and you probably shouldn't. Uh, Dwayne says, is there any reason you don't use concat? I find it and makes the code user easier to read and manage. I'm okay with that. That's totally okay. Jacob said, uh, I had no choice. The only other option was select star. I get it. You were young. You needed the money. That's how that works. So now earlier on, I had this dynamic order by, and one of you pointed out that the, <laughs> Jacob says, I still am, I still am young and I still need the money. I feel you. Uh, JD over in the Zoom chat says, 4,000 lines of stuff inside dynamic SQL. Uh, no, bad news. When you hit out in the real world, it's gonna be, uh, yes. I'm not happy about it either, but I'm also young and I need the money. I'm not really young, I just, I just need the money. So, uh, so inside here, uh, the, the next thing that I need to do is implement that dynamic order by. So what I've done is I've ripped out some pieces of dynamic SQL. This is really kind of a good synopsis of one of the problems with dynamic SQL is that the more you try to do, the bigger and uglier your code is going to become. It's going to have all kinds of things that you need to accomplish inside of it. So I've taken out the location and reputation parameters and all I have inside there is the display name and that's it. But then I'm gonna do dynamic ordering. Seems like everybody in the world wants to be able to sort all their columns by ascending and descending order, and they wanna make the database do it. I used to get really angry about that, and I used to tell people, don't sort inside the database. The database is the most expensive place to do all the sorting. Then I realized I get paid when they have performance problems. So I'm like, yeah, order buy's not so bad. Go ahead, you can totally do that. So what I'm saying in here is if they want to pass in something that they want to order by, knock yourself out. Pass in whatever columns that you want. You can even pass in multiple columns and ascending and descending. And what I'm saying here is if order by is not null, go pass in order by and let them go add whatever comments that they want into that string. Let's go put it into production and go see what happens. So I'll go execute it. And then we will go see what kind of queries this thing builds. So I'm saying go show me all of the Brents and I'd like them ordered by reputation. And it works. Here are all of the Brents starting with the lowest ranked reputation. What if I wanna see the high ones, no problem. Put in reputation descending, and now you get your data magically sorted by reputation descending. Oh. If I go look at the messages, I can see the exact query that this thing built. They took whatever the user passed in and used that in our T-SQL. Uh-oh. So let's see what else they could do if they wanted to. Let's try this. Wait a minute, I, I, I have two in two uh, uh, result sets. 
In here I said, order by reputation descending, and then I said semicolon, and I threw in a query like select star from sys databases. This is a tale as old as time. This is SQL injection. If you go look at the query that was created, people just added in whatever T SQL that they wanted. They injected their own query and your stored procedure went and executed this query exactly as is. So as long as you can select star from sys databases, Right now, I have a database named, say, Stack Overflow 2010. And in a moment, I will not. We're going to say in here, drop database Stack Overflow 2010. And I'm going to go execute the query again. It runs instantly with no messages, no warnings. Here's the query that it ran. And if I go over here and refresh the database list, boom, that database is gone. Whenever you take people's input exactly as is, like what I did here with this order by parameter, you are vulnerable to a thing called SQL injection. And it's such a comical farce that there's actually a web comic about it. And SQL Sneaker pointed it out up in Slack. SQL Sneaker says, hey, that, there's a, a put in a column to name, named Bobby Tables. He's referring to the infamous XKCD cartoon about Bobby Tables, a student who ends up dropping the, the or a student ends up dropping a school's uh, tables. Any time that you see someone get hacked, whenever you're seeing people get hacked out in the news, it's usually one of two things. Either someone left an unsecured file out in an Amazon S3 bucket somewhere. It's always Amazon S3. You ever wonder why it's not Azure? Nobody uses Azure. Now, number two, it's not true. It's kind of true. Uh, number two, it's SQL injection. All the time, you see all these SQL injection problems over and over and over again. Even in now in the year 2020, you'll read, open the newspaper, somebody gets hacked and it's SQL injection. You can never take of what someone else's inputs do. And over in the Zoom chat, JD says, as a minimum, all inputs should be cut off after the first semicolon. The problem is that doesn't work either. And there's a great series of posts that I'm going to refer you to over in the more info channel, or over in the more info thing at, up at our uh, links URL um, that talks about the problems involved with that. Instead, what you have to do is listen to whatever they asked for and then go construct your own inputs. And I'm going to show you an example here of what I mean by that. If they passed in an order by, then go add order by to the string, hear what they passed in, but then go construct your own string. Don't even use what they passed in. Go construct your own. I get it. This is much harder work, especially when you want to order by multiple columns, each of which can be ascending or descending. And good news, I have an example of that here in the code that you can go through and read through in order to get a really good example. But as you start to look at this, you see the problem. Even if I maximize this, we're beyond the point of where I can fit this stuff inside my same, uh, in, somebody's got a funny thing over in Slack around drop table companies. Now, I'm beyond the point where I can even show this to you at my preferred font resolution for things like presenting. When you start to build SQL injection, or when you start to build SQL injection, how's that for a Freudian slip? When you start to build dynamic SQL, your code gets more and more complex. So I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom of this. There's all kinds of examples in here that you can use when you go through the resources and learn everything that's involved with tuning and building dynamic SQL. Here's the takeaway for me. I think about building code is like a slider. You remember graphic equalizers? You probably don't, you're young. Graphic equalizers used to be this thing that we had in our car stereo, it was a little dial that you could move back and forth. We could drop up, pump up the bass and things like that. So there's a little slider you can move up and down. That's kind of how I think of code authorship. I think of it as a slider that you can move around from one place to another. Over on the far left-hand side, I have fast code that goes slow. <laughs> Yours says, drop the bass. 
Fast code that goes slow, this is what I mean by things like Entity Framework and Hibernate, Link to SQL, Dapper, anything that's an ORM that builds the code for you. I believe every developer should start here. I believe every application should start here because this writes pretty good SQL. It's not great SQL, but it's pretty good. It writes better SQL than an untrained developer. I know people who are like, hey, listen, trust me, everyone has to go write stored procedures right away. Everyone stop what you're doing, begin immediately writing stored procedures. But remember how at the beginning of this session, you were surprised at how those stored procedures performed poorly? This isn't your first rodeo. You've been working on T-SQL a while and yet you were learning things inside this session. It's hard to make stored procedures perform well. And if you just stand out there at the rooftops yelling and screaming at everybody to go do it your way, it's not like they have training. It's not like they're gonna be good and build fast, secure code. They're gonna build things that are vulnerable to SQL injection. So I prefer that people start all the way over at the Entity Framework and in Hibernate side, and when you want things that perform better, it's easy to say, oh, you know what you should do is you should go write stored procedures. But look at what we saw in the beginning of the session. They sucked. Performance was terrible. We were writing code that was just awful in terms of performance. When I want to get really good performance, I often end up way over here in the slow code that goes fast. For example, things that take a really long time in order to build but, and a really long time in order to debug, but they perform insanely well. That for me is what dynamic SQL is. It's just not the easy button. It's the really hard button. And I feel like I'm only beginning to open your eyes in terms of everything that you can do with dynamic SQL and everything that you have to learn. So what I like to do is I like to end all of my sessions with a link that's going to go and give you all kinds of things to go and learn more. So let's go take that. Let's go copy paste that out of here. And then let's go open up a web browser. And then let's go to monster and find better jobs. I'm just kidding. Um, let's go paste that into here. And then here, you're gonna be at this dynamic SQL landing page where I have all kinds of stuff, including where you can go get more resources, links to Erlen Summerskog's fantastic posts around dynamic search conditions, uh, uh, how you do dynamic SQL safely, um, a video with more information. I'll go put that over into the Slack channel. And that, plus two, I should scroll down and show you everything that I just talked about inside here, that whole demo script is all inside here as well. So you can scroll down and learn way more about dynamic SQL as well. So with that, now I'm gonna switch over to do totally open uh, Q&A. Let's see what questions y'all have in here from around dynamic SQL. So let's see here, uh, doo, 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 doo. Okay, I'm gonna come back down here. Somebody had a good question inside here. The Peter Doyle said, the Peter Doyle said, can you parameterize whole table names or partial table names? You can, but again, you just gotta be really careful about how you sanitize their inputs. As soon as you start doing stuff like this, you're immediately super vulnerable to SQL injection. The thing that I would usually tell people is if you really need to go to dynamic tables, there's probably a larger problem. Like there's something else that we need to talk about in terms of application design. Uh, Jay Morehouse says, Jim P is the bomb. I don't know who Jim P is, but Jim, oh, he's probably the other session. It's the other session. That's exactly what that is. Um, let's see here. Oh, Hugo says, are there, oh, uh, <laughs> Hugo talks over in uh, the questions and answers. Are there, there are tools available that you can simply point to any web uh, website and they automatically try all kinds of SQL injection. Yeah, if you do a Google for SQL injection toolkit, there are toolkits available that will try this automatically, that will automatically try SQL injection across all kinds of uh, methods. Um, so, and they're constantly, everybody's always constantly running these tools. So there, I've been seeing sites out in the public where they drop just one query out into production and nobody really even thought about it. And within minutes they were hacked by something that was just doing an automated SQL injection attempt. And then as soon as it caught it, it phoned home to whoever ran the tool to go then and do more manual follow-ups saying, look what I found, you know, we found SQL injection. 
All right, that, I, there are no other questions in here. Y'all are quiet today. Well, hopefully y'all like this. Uh, you can learn more over brentozar.com slash go slash dynamic. I should do a poll uh, in here to say how many of y'all learned something. So poll, I learned something in this session. Yes, no, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, anonymous, limit one, and then let y'all choose. CHR says, thank you, Brent. Fantastic as always. You're welcome. Um, I really wish that I could have done the float over video thing. That drives me crazy that I really wanted to float over, but it looks like Zoom was having a problem with it here. Uh, good. It looks like lots of people learned things. So that's fantastic. Very cool. Uh, Sri, I'll teach you something. In order to answer a poll in, in, uh, in here, you just click on the number that you want, like over on the right-hand side. Brandon says, uh, may I ask an unrelated question? Yes. That was the unrelated question. That's a, you only got one. Um, says, uh, the artist who does your site work is fantastic. May I ask their name? Yes, that is Eric Larson. If you search for Eric Larson artwork, uh, his site is out here and I'll go copy paste that out into Slack so that y'all can see it. Um, has just a phenomenal illustrator. I can't recommend him highly enough. I have so many cool uh, new additional drawings coming that are just gorgeous. Just absolutely love them. 